This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Friday night, the Lord had me teach on something else. And so this morning, we have uh, shifted our Friday night study to our first study this morning, and that's systematic theology. I have defined the doctrine of revelation to you As follows, Revelation is that free act of the sovereign God by which he graciously makes himself known to man. Now, what I said that we were going to uh, start off doing here with Revelation is I was going to give you two big major points about it, and we've been looking at the first of those. And it's contained right in the definition of Revelation, and the other one uh, more or less is as well, which we will not get to yet this morning. Two introductory points about Revelation that help steer us on the right course in studying this doctrine, and that very simply stated is this, that Revelation is self-disclosure, and it comes by God's own initiation. And we might think, well, that's just contained in the word Revelation. Well, not necessarily, because I might come and ask you for something, and then, you know, ask you after some truth or fact or I desire to be privy to some knowledge, and so as a result of my asking, you reveal it to me. But the initiation was mine. But that's never true with God. Divine revelation is always by God's own initiative. It's divine initiation. God takes the initiative himself to reveal himself to sinful man. And I said underneath that that also... At the same time, God has sovereign control over all of Revelation's particulars. And that's what I want to get to again this morning, part two of a two-part study. The fact that God has sovereign control over Revelation's particulars. There's probably no subject in the Bible, friend, that's any greater than the doctrine of God's sovereignty. There's nothing any greater, there's nothing any more profound or powerful than the doctrine of God's sovereignty. It's not the priesthood under the old, minist- under the old uh, covenant or dispensation or something like that. All of these are just bits and pieces and parts of a whole. Because what stands behind it all is the triune God who from eternity, because he's sovereign, has decreed a certain thing or certain things to come to pass or to come about. As a matter of fact, it's not certain thing or certain things, but all things that happen have been so decreed by God. And that's an awesome truth that's difficult. You cannot escape it, and you can study it, and it's very difficult to study when you think that all things have been decreed by God to come to pass. All things. Everything from the rise of a nation to the fall of a sparrow, as um, my mentor was so prone to say, and is seen in Scripture as well. When you combine the book of Daniel, the rise of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar thought he had built all those things by his own power, chapter 4, remember. Until one day he was out uh, on, in his, on his terrace saying, look at all these wonderful things I've done, and a voice came from heaven and said, because you've not given the glory to God, you're going to be turned into an animal. And he was. And he thought, you know, he was a great and mighty king. You study about him in the encyclopedias, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. That was all God's work, not Nebuchadnezzar's. And he mistakenly thought it was his own, and God said, I'll humble you as a result of that. And, you know, what happened, that his hair grew long like bird's feathers and his nails long like the claws on an animal, and the dew of heaven fell upon him. Uh, for seven times, seven months or seven years or something, until his understanding returned to him, again by divine decree, and he blessed the Most High God of heaven and earth. And he said, now I know that there is a God in heaven, and he rules among the inhabitants of heaven and earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? God is sovereign. And then whenever you move this over as far as the believer is concerned, I said there's really no doctrine any greater than God's sovereignty. Then we have the subject of the sovereign grace of God, the sovereign grace of God. And nothing is more meaningful to us than that because everything we have, whether it's the death of Christ or spiritual gifts in our own life, everything that uh, accrues the, the believer, everything that comes as a benefit to us has come as a result of the grace of God and gr- God's grace is not merited. The very name, the very doctrine means otherwise. If it's of grace and it's not of works, otherwise... Grace is no more grace. 
If it's of works, it's not of grace, otherwise works are no more works. If it's by grace, it's by God's sovereign grace, because everything God does is sovereign. So God has sovereign control over Revelation's particulars. And I listed five of those. The act, A-C-T, the time, the content, the method, and the recipient. The act, the time, that is what is done, when it's done, what's contained in it, the content, how it's done, the method, and to whom it's given. E, or number five, the recipient. Act, time, content, method, recipient. An understanding of God's sovereignty, an understanding of God's sovereign grace should be an impetus to faith in our life because there's nothing we can do anyway. And there's everything in the world that God can do because he is sovereign. We've already discussed the first of these. It took us a long time to look at this, the act that God has sovereign control over this particular of revelation. He's got sovereign divine control over the act itself. That is, over whether or not there's going to be revelation. We can't just take revelation for granted. Revelation is something that God has decreed, but he could have decreed otherwise. So by the act, I mean the very act itself. The very fact that there is revelation, has been, will be, God has sovereign control over that. I read a quotation from Henry's theology that went like this, the revelation of flame and sword in paradise lost might have exhausted his disclosure. That might have been the last time we heard from God. He said, Adam, Eve, I gave you an opportunity. You fail, out you go. That's the end for the human race. Or oh, you'll give birth to children. They'll all be born in the same sin that you've committed, and they'll never know me. The only two people who ever would have known God in a special way were Adam and Eve, but they lost that knowledge, and so God said the revelation of flame and sword and paradise lost is the end. He could have done that, but he didn't. He was gracious to them. Or Henry goes on, he could have bared his final wrath on crucifixion weekend when they took God's own sinless, spotless, holy, immaculate son and without mercy nailed him cruelly to a tree. God could have said, that's it. I put up with sin on this planet long enough and now you have committed the greatest sin you could have committed by killing my own son. That is it. Man has no more opportunity from here on out. That was just the beginning, though. That's the mystery of it all. That was just the beginning of God's plan of forgiveness of sinners on the earth. It was something Peter said that God had decreed Acts 3 and 4. He said, you took him and by wicked hands crucified and slew him, but you've only fulfilled what God has spoken by the mouth of all the prophets since the world began. Rather than being the last final act, the culmination of all of men's sins, after which and on the basis of which, God said, that's it. I wipe my hands of my man. I wipe my hands of mankind. God did, and that was just the beginning of the act of reconciliation. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ as he hung on the tree of Calvary reconciling the world unto himself. He was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and hath committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the revelation of flame and sword and paradise lost might have exhausted his disclosure, but it didn't. Or he could have bared his final wrath on crucifixion weekend, but he didn't. No, rather he goes on, yet divine revelation offers fallen man a place in God's kingdom. So there's the act. Let's come secondly then, this morning, something we have not discussed yet, to the subject of time. God has sovereign control over the timing of revelation. Over the timing of revelation. Uh, I like to think of Hebrews 1, 2, and I'll use it for both time and method. Hebrews 1, uh, 1, 1 and 2. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Just the way Hebrews starts off. God, who at divers manners and at sundry times or sundry times in divers manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son so forth and we hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds very famous passage in hebrews it speaks of a couple of different things there in verse one god who at sundry times now sundry isn't sunday sundry it's an old english word that, that means various 
that God, in other words, he doesn't always speak to every man. He's not speaking 24 hours a day. God who at sundry times, various times, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 speaks of sundry times. In other words, it speaks of the fact, and it goes on to say, God spoke to us by the prophets, and now he's spoken to us in these last days by his son. Who is the one who has control over the timing of revelation when it comes? Who is the one? God and God alone has, has control over the timing of when that will come. That's why these, these ideas, these uh, uh, testimonies or testimonials of how I was seeking after God and got real hungry and one day I found God, at best are sloppy testimonials because often they, they totally neglect, totally fail miserably to understand the sovereignty of God. Someone doesn't just wake up one day and decide they want to turn their life around or turn over a new leaf. God reaches down sovereignly and gets a hold of them. Now, it's interesting to me why or how man, Christian man, doesn't like to hear that because that's what his Christianity is supposed to be all about. But it's that humanism that creeps back in. We want to think that we had something to do with it, that we finally reached the end of our rope and we were seeking after God, and we don't know that he was drawing us by his spirit the whole time. Paul says in, is it Romans 2, 4, do you despise the goodness and pity of God, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Romans 2, 4, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We weren't led to repentance by our own seeking or searching. We were led by God's goodness. His goodness might have been manifested in us in giving us an empty heart so that we would end up having a hungry heart. But that's still the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So we have to say away with all of this humanism. We've had enough of that for so many centuries in Christianity. And it's just, there's probably more around us today than there ever has been before. People thinking that they're going to get the work of the kingdom done. Whether it's the Greater Works Ministry people, or it's the televangelists thinking we've got to get more money and get on more stations and evangelize the world. And you know, the, or the uh, psalmist said, he was the writer of Proverbs as well, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Right. Except the Lord keepeth the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And you can have all of that energy and all of that money and get nobody saved and do nothing for the kingdom of God. That's humanism saying we've got to get on more stations and we've just got to do this and do this and do this and do this. And you know, a, a million dollars spent there, a million, a billion dollars spent there, won't do a tenth of the good that will be done through maybe just a moment of the Spirit's anointing in a brother or sister's life. That's right. Because it's God moving and it's God's work then. So we've still got all of that humanism around us today. You know, they used to fight over things like that. Back whenever people believed in truth, and they don't really believe in that today, they believe in relativism, that everything is relative to time and people and circumstances. But back in the good old days, like the post-Reformation era, whenever people believed in truth, they had heresy trials. They put people on trial, church leaders on trial for heresy. Well, you couldn't do that today. Bigot, narrow-minded, prejudice, pluralism, toleration, this is a free country. You know all the things that would be said. They put people on trial. Put them on trial for what? For teaching this humanistic garbage that goes around us today all the time and is praised by people. I'm speaking of the Synod of Dort in 1619 in the lowlands in Holland when the teachings of Jacobus Arminius were put on trial. They were condemned as heresy by the Dutch church, by the Calvinistic Dutch church. They're still heresy today because they deny God's sovereignty. They contain latent humanism and sometimes blatant humanism, Amen. just depending on who the exponent of it is. Maybe Socinian, Socinius and Socinianism were a little more blatant than the actual Arminianism of Arminius, but it was there in germ or seed form anyway. So what I mean by time and God's sovereign control over this is that he speaks only when he wants to. And we have to remember that. We as believers, we, ha we can't be like the world out there and tend to think that we can get something out of God anytime we want to. Now he has his mercy, and there's that sign, we go to him and seek him and he gives us, he said, if you lack wisdom, ask and I'll give it, but... He's even the one working that will in us. It's always from his side. It always starts from his side and finishes from his side. We're just an instrument or a vessel in his hand. He speaks only when he wants to. Only when he wants to. 
You see, I could just teach, well, we believe God's sovereign, and I teach one little 30-minute uh, message on the sovereignty of God or the doctrine of revelation that it is a free act, a free act of the sovereign God by which he graciously reveals himself to man, and we could say, yeah, we got that down, let's go on. But then maybe there'd be some people, not necessarily here in this church, but there'd be some people out there, and if they really heard later, maybe in a four-tape series instead of one, what you really meant by that, they'd say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. That God speaks only when he wants to speak? No, wait a minute. Can't I just pick up the Bible and just discover truth? Not unless the Holy Spirit shows it to you. Right. Not even with a Bible there and an open book before you. The Spirit and the Word always go together. Amen. And I can easily prove that. Why is it that all of the heathen out there on the Bible don't see the truth that we see? It has to be a sovereign work of God. Why can the theologian see so much that's good and right and end up with so much that's bad and wrong? They own the same Bible that we own. They own the same one that we own. It is a sovereign act of God. It's a free act. Free. God, you know, something's free. He doesn't owe it to anybody. God doesn't owe revelation to anyone. It's free. It's a free act. It's not, he's not um, constrained or controlled by the desires or um, preferences of men. It's a free act of the sovereign God. Free and sovereign, is, you almost have some redundancy there because if he's sovereign, it's free. And if it's free, God's sovereign. He doesn't owe anything to anyone. And he doesn't even owe it to us as his people. His, his revelation comes at his own timing. At his own timing. This is why if you'll open up to the book of Psalms, well, maybe we ought to just take the Hebrews passage. Maybe that's better known. But Psalm 95 is where this is first uh, verbalized. And then Paul quotes this in Hebrews 3. And of course it goes back to the Pentateuch as far as narrative is concerned. But this is why we have the urgency. You want to underscore this. This is why we have the urgency of Psalm 95 in Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, 7 and following. And that's a quotation from Psalm 95. This is why we have the urgency, because notice that in these verses we do have revelation as the subject, but more particularly it's timing. And we read thus, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, it's a timing word, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's why we have the urgency of an appeal, such as the appeal we find in these verses. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, when they provoked God. In the day of temptation, in the desert, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. He's talking about that whole period. And how many times of revelation do they have? Everything from the revelation there at the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, that's a revelation of God's concern and his power, his omnipotence, uh, on behalf of the nation of Israel. And what do they do? Well, I think we can't even get out of the next chapter, chapter 15, and they're complaining at the bitter waters of Merah. So we have another revelation of God. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And the next chapter, they're complaining about something else. They're complaining, complaining. They're not hearing God's voice and receiving God's word. They're tempting him and proving him, and as a result, they saw his works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. See, that's a long parenthesis there. Paul says, if you attach the first word of verse 7 to verse 12, he says, wherefore, take heed, brethren. But he wants to give us a long parenthetical digression on why we should take heed. Not only the wherefore of verse 7, that goes back up to the end of verse 6, that we better hold on to the end whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope for it unto the end, wherefore take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Notice again the timing worked. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. He speaks only when he wants to. He's speaking now. Whenever a minister stands up and preaches God's word, God is speaking then. And, and we have to underscore the urgency of that all. As you're meditating on the Word of God during the day and something strikes you, God is speaking to you. It's urgent. He's speaking then. Whenever you're reading the Bible and something blesses you, God's speaking to you. It's urgent at that time. Today, 
as the Holy Spirit says, if you hear his voice. He's speaking, not everyone's hearing, but he's speaking. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. You see, no man has private control. No man has private control over the timing of God's revelation. He truly speaks at sundry times. Let me give you some examples of how sundry these times can be. Just a few. You could pull out hundreds of them from the Bible. These were ones that popped into my mind. He spoke to one man, Gideon, this is Judges 6, while he was hiding in the wine press, secretly threshing out the wheat for fear of the Midianites. Well, what an unlikely place to get a revelation from God. The angel of the Lord walked up and said, Hold thou mighty man of valor. Gideon said, Where is he? Which one are you talking about? I come from the least tribe, and I'm the least of my father's family uh, in the least tribe. Which one are you talking about? It couldn't be me. Well, he was the only one there. And Jesus was talking right to him. Now, just think about that for a moment. Put yourself in Gideon's place. What was going on five minutes before the Lord walked up? Probably nothing. He's just threshing wheat. Or an hour after he left, nothing. God has sovereign control over the time. He just comes in, reveals himself, and then he's gone. That's why there's urgency involved. You better hear him when he comes and when he speaks. All of us, the world out there who is hearing this Christian message had better take heed and pay attention. Balaam received a revelation as he cursed and smote his ass in anger. He got the revelation through the mouth of his ass. That's Numbers 22. So many different places and contexts in which revelation comes, which only shows us, which only serves to manifest the fact that God has absolute control over the minute, precise timing of revelation. In Genesis 20, Abimelech, as he attempted to go to sleep at night, must have had a fitful night's sleep because as he slept, he dreamed dreams. God came to him in a dream and said, Thou art a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken is another man's wife. Revelation. John, Revelation 1, as he walked on the island of Patmos, he didn't know. I don't think that he knew. And hey, in about, let's see, four hours and 18 minutes from right now, I'm going to be writing 22 chapters of the Bible. You're just walking and God appears to you in the Spirit. And then said, now what you've seen and heard, write in a book and send it to the seven assemblies in Asia. One woman one day must have run out of water at her house. This is John 4, and it was time to go down to the well and get some. So she walked down to the well, and lo and behold, who was there but the Messiah? Now, there were a lot of other women who went to that well, maybe at a lot of other times, but that woman went at that time, and Jesus said, if you drink of the water that I'll give you, you'll never thirst again. The Samaritan woman at the well, John 4. We've gone from islands to wells to wine presses. God has sovereign control over the timing of revelation. Why is it you have a vision or you have a dream and then you go so many days or weeks or months before you have another one? Or if you've heard God's voice audibly, you hear it audibly and you go so many years before you hear it again. Is, is there some lack of righteousness on your part? Well, there could be, but that's not necessarily true. God has sovereign control. In Psalm 73, uh, the psalmist got his revelation whenever he walked into church. He said, My, I was struggling over the prosperity of the wicked. I was so foolish as a beast because I was envious over their materialism. And when I thought to understand these things, they were too great until I went into the sanctuary. And then I saw the latter end that God has put their foot on ice on a slippery place. And their latter end is going to punish them for the good they've had in life. Psalm 73. He got his revelation... He thought and thought and thought about it. How can you explain the fact that here I'm being chastened all the day long, every, every day, and the wicked out there are growing fatter and fatter and fatter in prosperity? How can I explain that? He said, I thought about that, and I wrestled over that. When I wanted to say something, I didn't because I didn't want to offend the, the children of my people. But whenever I went into the sanctuary, somehow into the, ta into the courts of the tabernacle, a revelation came to him. I don't know how he didn't tell us how it came, but he said, whenever I went into the sanctuary, a revelation came. 
How many times has it been whenever we came into the sanctuary that we got an answer to something that we needed to know or something we were struggling with? And we had already been thinking about it and praying about it, but you know, you, you can't manipulate God. There's no way that we can manipulate God. We just have to claim it, lay claim to it, and trust God and walk it out until it comes to us. He says if you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he'll give it to you liberally. He tells you the degree, it'll be liberally, but he doesn't tell you the timing, like, I'll give it to you yesterday. He says how much you'll give, he said, I'll give it to you liberally. But he didn't say when you'll give it. Sometimes it might be Thursday. Sometimes it will be Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Sometimes it might be next month. And we just have to keep holding on until the revelation comes. Or take Acts 9. Here we have a Jewish scribe, a trained theologian in the law, who was on a frenzied trip to Damascus of inquisitional proportion. His name is Saul, and suddenly a light shone from heaven, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice speaking in the Hebrew tongue saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Who art thou, Lord? He can't see. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Wow. If that's not sovereign control over the timing of revelation, I don't know what is. That's sovereign control. Do you think Saul was out to go to Sunday school that day to raise his hand and get a gold star on his forehead for eating enough crackers in Sunday school and then walking the aisle in church? Was Saul out to get saved that day? No. Saul was on a frenzied maddening trip of inquisitional proportions to bring men and women who called on the name of Christ and were part of that way in Damascus to Jerusalem and lock them up. He's not seeking God. He's not trying to get saved. And 20th century, or this was even uh, more in vogue last century, well, 21st century, I don't know what people would think then, but last century, in the 19th century, people, Christian psychologists, or whatever they wanted to call themselves, want to try to do a number on Paul's mind and say, I think that from what I can tell about the apostle or the man Saul, he was, he was probably really struggling over his persecution of the church, whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing to do, and bump, they go on and on and on. We don't have any hint of that in Scripture. He says later in his testimony, and he was smitten on the face before the high priest for this, and he said, all my life I've lived in good conscience before God and man. He did what he thought was right, but it was dead wrong. You can follow your conscience and be as wrong as the demons below. He said, I lived in a good conscience. That is, I did what my conscience said, and his conscience said, kill the Christians. And he was committing a great sin against the Lord for doing that. So God truly speaks at sundry times. And if I can make it more particular as far as mankind is concerned and the opportunity that is available, I think that we see examples in Scripture where this is a frightening thing, doesn't have to frighten, and it never will, the heart of the elect, but it is something that sobers them up, as Calvin would say in his writings, and, and will wake us out of our slothfulness and deep sleep just going along our merry way as a believer in church, that there are examples of people for whom it became too, double O, T double O, too late. Too late. Didn't Isaiah said, call upon the Lord while he's near? While he's near, it implies he won't always be near, Isaiah 55. Call upon him while God will hear. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Like in Hebrews chapter 12. Well, maybe we ought to turn over there and look at this awesome passage. Hebrews 12. See, the elect always will prove themselves by their life. You've heard the analogy before of the archway. On one side is written, whosoever will. Because that simply expresses those on this side of entrance into the kingdom. Those on this side uh, are just whosoever's. And you walk through it and you turn around and look up on the other side and it says ordained from the foundation of the world. So the elect prove it, you see, by their lifestyle. They can't just take things for granted. 
Hebrews 12, you know, this is on chastisement, and Paul's talking about the fact that if you endure it, then you can know that you're God's son. He's dealing with you as a son. If you don't endure it, I guess, I guess it's not chastening. It's just God's judgment on the world. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 talks about us having to judge those who are within. He said, we don't have to worry about those who are without. That is, the world, God judgeth them. We can only exercise discipline and judgment in our own midst. So we have to as the assembly of God. And then he says in verse 15, looking diligently, he's talking about, you know, don't, don't uh, sorrow too much over chastening. It's, if you endure it, then it's going to yield some fruit, some fruit of righteousness and holiness in your life. Looking, and so lift up your hands, be joyful, praise God. People get a long, drawn-out look on their face, and God wants us to praise him, just praise God. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. He goes back to Deuteronomy 29, which speaks of a root of bitterness. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one, now he wasn't a fornicator, but he was profane, unspiritual, carnal, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Now he's not teaching that a person, once they have been washed by the blood of Jesus and written in the Lamb's book of life and have been born again and regenerated, that they can become now unregenerated again. He's not saying that. But he is saying this, that, that we all, as far as we can tell, are walking the walk, and that's even true for the non-elect, as history will prove them to be non-elect. They're walking the walk, making the profession, and so externally they appear to have the birthright. Hebrews 12, 16, the birthright of Christianity, of being a Christian. But then it's always the test of time which will prove whether or not they will sell that birthright for one morsel of meat. And what is that? Well, it's whatever temptation people fall into or or argument the devil gives them which calls them to say, well, I just can't do this anymore. I can't walk this walk anymore. So here's my morsel of meat. I traded my walk with God, which is really no walk if it so proves itself to be in light of eternity. I trade my walk with God for this morsel of meat. People have traded for over all types of different things. There's so many different morsels of meat out there. What I want to get to is verse 17, for ye know, now Paul's, writing to Jews, and they knew their Old Testament. And he said, you knew this, you know this, you know. You've read the, the Old Testament account in the book of Genesis. You know how that afterward, when he wouldn't have inherited the blessing, remember when he went in and his brother took it by guile, so his name is supplanter, that Jacob took it by guile, what did he say? Oh, Isaac, my father Isaac, do you not have a blessing for me? And what Isaac say? He said, I bless Jacob and Jacob shall be blessed. I cannot reverse it. And he wept bitterly with tears. When he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, so he sought it carefully with tears. I'm saying there, there are examples in Scripture of people for whom it is too, T-double-O, too late. In Genesis 18, I think it's the last verse there, thinking of what Isaiah taught us, to seek the Lord while he may be found and to pray, to call upon him while he's near. That means sometimes God is not near. Well, not near in the sense that revelation is not taking place or occurring. God came to, to uh, Abraham here in the beginning of this chapter, Genesis 18, and talked with him when he sat in the door of his tent in the heat of the day and talked with him later. And then look at the last verse there. I don't have my uh, Bible turned to that. But look at the last verse there in Genesis 18. And do we not see that God went up from talking with Abraham? He talked with him so long and then he left. In other words, he's no longer near. Well, God's always near him in the sense that he's going to be with him. But talking with him, he only talks whenever he wants to talk. He only talks whenever he wants to talk. And I don't mean to paint some picture of a sadistic, reticent deity or something. God is a gracious Father uh, whose courts are always open for us to run into and cry unto him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. God invites us to come into his gates and his courts and his presence with joy and dancing and singing all the time. But you know, he gives us sometimes special revelation about something and we need to take heed whenever it's given. 
Think of how you got saved. It was a work of God's own free grace. He spoke to you. Or when you first learned of the truth of the baptism of the Holy Spirit or divine healing, God is the one who revealed that to you. Why didn't you see that or hear that or learn that earlier? People would say, well, I just wasn't in the right place. Well, let's ask more questions. Why weren't you in the right place? Because I was something. Why were you somewhere else? It's like asking the evolutionists. We ask them, well, where did everything come from? Well, well, we came from monkeys. Where did monkeys came, come from? Well, they came from fish. Well, where did they come? Well, they came from, all right, all right, we'll keep on working until the end of the day. Where did the last thing that you're going to tell us come from? Where did it come from? Well, I don't know. Well, the Bible says God. In the beginning, God created all things, visible and invisible. They think they've got a neat theory to say that something happened in a Big Bang theory. Well, where did you get those things to explode in the first place? Let's say the theory's right. Well, where did the gas and the particles come from? See, that's not, a, that's not answering anything as far as we're concerned. We're not saying how did things get the way we see them right now. We're saying how did things originate in the first place? And if you, of course, keep pressing them, they'll have to probably talk about eternal generation or something. Well, the world's always been here. Well, at least you gave us what your answer is. It's just that you're wrong. Or various other truths that we have, quote, come across, unquote, in our life. God is the one who's revealed those things to us. And as there are examples in Scripture of individuals for whom it was too late, listen to this statement. This is rather earth-shaking. There will come a day soon when God permanently withdraws his offer of forgiveness to the human race. There will come a day soon. See, forgiveness and the offer of that and the work of the cross, that only lasts so long. That's only available so long. So I would say individually it's only available so long for some people get to the place where they have so hardened their hearts they will not hear from God anymore. That's what happened with the nation of Israel. What could God do with them or to them? Nothing. They had so hardened their heart. It wasn't that he had not given them revelation. It was just the opposite. He had given them an abundance of revelation. And what they do, they spurned it. And they provoked him and tempted him and proved him in the wilderness. And so there came a time in the history of the desert generation for whom it was too late. It was simply too late for them. And I'm saying it's going to come one day too late for the whole globe. People tend to think, I don't know, that's why I wrote this sentence down in this way and gave it to you verbatim as I wrote it down, because people tend not to think along this line. They tend to think of, uh, the world continuing forever and ever and ever and things going on as they have been going on uh, ad infinitum, but that's not true. There will come a day soon when God permanently withdraws his offer of forgiveness to the sinner. And of course, the reason he withdraws it is because the number of the elect is now complete. Whenever that's complete, that's the end. God's not offering forgiveness to the unbeliever out to the non-elect out there anyway because God would be frustrating his own purpose. God's sovereign. Whenever he extends offer, that's a, we could do a, a study on that. The word offer in English and the word offer in Latin and how Calvin used the word and so forth. Sometimes we use the word, I guess today in English it's used in a kind of like it can be rejected sense. But that's not the biblical way or the Calvinistic way. Whenever God offers, we receive. But there's a looser way or a freer way or I guess a humanistic way to use the word in theology today that God offers forgiveness to the unbeliever out there and uh, he says well let me think about it for a day or two and he weighs the the way of the cross versus the thrills of this world and he says no nah, i don't think i'll take it sorry god check me out on another day god doesn't play around with wicked people like that whenever he puts grace on a person's life it's efficacious or as they have said it is irresistible it will accomplish the purpose for which it's given but there will come a day when because of the fact that the number of the elect, the total number of the redeemed down through history, whether from Jew or from Gentile, whenever that total number is complete, God knows, I don't know what it is, whether it's 1,800 or 18 billion. Well, it's not 1,800, it's much more than that. Whether it's 18 million or 18 billion or 18 trillion, God knows the number of that. Whenever that's complete, he withdraws the offer because there are no more people to save. The rest of the world has already been consigned into eternal damnation. 
but not getting too deep there for a moment in, in theology, just let the sentence stand for what it says because of the emotional impact that it gives to us. There will come a day soon when God permanently withdraws his offer of forgiveness to this dying and sinning world. We would like to convince the sinners of this out there, and of course those that we could or do would prove only by that they're elect. We'd like to convince the whole world that you better, if you hear his voice, receive it now because you can reach the place in life where it's too late, T-O-O, late. It's too late to repent. So God has sovereign control over the timing. And something else I'd like to say, and I said this before, maybe in the last message in this, in this series, is that even in our study and meditation of God's Word, now this isn't Logos Rhema type teaching, but even in our study and meditation of God's Word, we have to remember that it's the Spirit's voice that speaks through Scripture to us. And we know nothing apart from His aid. I know how people could get into that and debate that and say, well, any heathen could look at a verse and get the meaning of it, but I'm going to stay with what I just said that we know nothing apart. We're just ignorant beasts grouping in the darkness. We know nothing apart from the Spirit's help and aid in the interpretation and reading of Scripture. He's the divine author of it. He's the one who infallibly knows the meaning of it, and he's the only one who can infallibly communicate that meaning to our spirit. So that's something to consider as we read God's Word. I mean, even having it available to us is grace. And as we read and our eyes are open and we can understand, that's grace as well. Then let me come to the third thing. And I won't have much to say about the third and fourth. We'll spend a little more time finally on the fifth this morning. The content, the content of Revelation. It depends on God again. In your salvation, the content is salvation by faith through the death of Jesus Christ. And you didn't need to hear that whenever you needed the Holy Spirit. You needed to hear the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. The content of Revelation varies, but God is the one who has sovereign control over it. I noted down here uh, for a scripture passage, Deuteronomy 29, 29, where we're told the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Some things he just doesn't tell us about. And it's vain and humanistic of us to attempt to intrude into those. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may learn to love the Lord and fear him and walk in his ways. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things that are revealed, the things, what things? Well, the Mosaic Law, the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel of John, the Book of Revelation, a lot has been revealed. The things that have been revealed are for us and for our children. And we cannot pry secrets out of the Godhead. God does not yield to our intrusive curiosity apart from revelation. He's a fathomless, impenetrable mystery. So the content is at God's discretion. Fourthly, the method now, a lot of our study here in systematics on Revelation is going to concern methods of special and general revelation and the various categories underneath those two. So I'm going to reserve that for then. Method, how God goes about revealing. Again, I have Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God who at sundry times and in divers manners or ways. Divers, again, like sundry, means various. There are various ways. The cross is a revelation. The tabernacle was a revelation. The tree in the garden was a revelation. The stars are a revelation. David said even the heavens declare they're a revelation. They're revealing the glory of God. So there are not only sundry times at which God speaks, but there are divers ways by which he speaks. He can speak by an ass. He can speak by... Your pastor, he can speak by your wife, he can speak by your husband, by your child, by your parent. He can speak by an enemy. Oh, then that one's pretty hard to receive right there. He can speak by an enemy. I remember hearing someone's testimony not long ago where, well, I don't know if I can remember all of it, but here we've got a Christian brother and he's at work and the heathens are around him and he's always, you know, giving his testimony of I believe this and I believe that and I'm a saint and you're a sinner and all this and... 
one day some machine, I guess, was not working very well, and he just had a thing to say, a thing or two to say about that machine and how. And one of the heathen caught him on that. What happened to your Christianity? He said, "You know what I wanted to tell him was, you're a sinner. You don't know anything anyway." But he said, "I knew better though. I knew that he knew more than I knew at that time." And you know, praise God, he had the gracious to humble himself and submit to his lost friend there in the world. What happened to your Christian? Ever been talked to by your enemy? That's humbling. Amen. When you're the one who's given a good testimony and your enemy is the one who catches you whenever you fall, that's humbling. But God has control over that, and that's sometimes very good. Whenever it's our enemies who catch us and God speaks to us through them. See, because Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 speaks of divers' ways, that means we can't close our ears. Even the heretics have something scriptural to say. That's the whole problem with heresy. It's mixed with truth. But even the heretics have something good to say. People would like to say, well, I want to find the one man who has all the truth and nothing but the truth, and I'll just follow him. Well, I, I don't know anybody like that yet. Well, I'm not going to listen to any of the people out there like, well, Jacob is Arminius because he was an Arminian, or Calvin because he practiced infant baptism by sprinkling. Well, Arminius had some other good things to say, not as many as Calvin, and Calvin had a whole lot of good things to say, but not everything he said was good. God can speak uh, via divers' ways. We have to have our ears open and listen. Now, is this the truth? It doesn't matter who it's coming from. Come from friend or foe from heretic or saintly canonized theologian. Is it true according to God's word? Then I'm required to believe it. It doesn't matter who it comes from. If it's not true, it doesn't matter who it's come, who, again, it comes from. I'm not required to believe it. And then fifthly and finally this morning, God has sovereign control over Revelation's particulars in the recipient. In the, this is the awesome part. God is revealing himself today. That he is is a fact that you are part of the company of people being given this precious revelation may or may not be true. If it is, it is purely by grace. Let me say that again, that God is revealing himself today as a fact. It's going on in the heavens, it's going on in the church, it's going on in the charismatic movement. That you are part of the company of people being given that revelation may or may not be true. And if it is, then it is purely by the grace of Jesus Christ. This is meant to keep us humble before God and keep us seeking his face. I know sometimes people are tempted to look at and think of other people as someone who's great or who's known all of this all along, but none of that's ever true. Let's look at a variety of passages here. The New Testament will start in Matthew's Gospel. Recipient, <clears throat> what a priceless, precious privilege it is to be a part of the company receiving God's revelation today. We could have gotten saved, friends, and, I mean, truly gotten saved, living a life out there in the world, and then truly gotten saved and joined the Baptist church. And just said, I'm a Baptist now, and I'm gonna and be good in the Baptist church and serve it and, and go to Sunday school and teach a lesson if they put a quarterly in your hand. And then we get some people that come to us and tell us about the charismatic movement, and we say, No, I, we don't believe that around here. You go on away from here. And they go on away, and God just lets us go on our way as a Baptist the rest of our life. That could have happened. Of course, you could have not even gotten saved in the first place. But then I'm saying you could have gotten saved and joined the Baptist church, or you could have done what I've said thus far until we get to the point the charismatic friends came and rather than you rejecting you say praise the Lord I want that and you will see that and you become a charismatic Baptist a part of the renewal movement in the Baptist church and you stay there the rest of your life as a charismatic Baptist or you could have come out and moved to Tulsa and gone to school and you're not a Baptist any longer you're truly a charismatic or you could have or you could you see there are so many different places we could find ourselves in in life. God has sovereign control over the recipient of revelation to whom he gives how much he has control over that. The people to whom it's given and how much he gives. It's awesome that we can even talk about this. Like we don't have any control over it and we don't. We just have to say thank God, thank God, thank God for his wonderful love.
we don't we can talk about it and here I am up here I've got it and I believe I've got it and you've got it and you believe you've got it and I'm teaching on it and you're listening to what I have to say and, and yet none of us have we can't even with our little pinky get uh, our finger on it none of us have any control over it at all it's all up to God he expects us to praise him you see it's a mystery because people say well then that means that if it's all up to God I can just go to sleep in life no because if he's working your life it produces certain things in your life it's going to make us serve God and praise him and love him Matthew 13 verse 10 why speakest thou unto them in parables he spoke to the, verse 2, great multitude. Just a lot of people who came and listened to Jesus the teacher. As he would expound in these, on these profound matters in this interesting parabolic way. And so they said, well, why speak a sound of them in parables? And he said, because, notice he didn't really, he didn't really answer the question until the end of the verse. Because God's focus of concentration is on the elect and not on the non-elect. He, he answers the question, why do you not speak to us in parables? Why do you tell us things plainly? They ask the question, why do you speak to them in parables? Notice he doesn't answer the them, he answers the you, because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Some of the mysteries here are the various types of soils and people's response to God's word. That's a mysterious subject there, how you can have a hundred people in a hundred folding chairs in the same building at the same time, under the same circumstances, listening to the same minister preach the same message. And maybe they all shout at the same time. But some, as soon as they get out of the meeting because they didn't understand what was going on or what was being said, the devil comes and snatches the word away from them. The devil's always busy trying to do that, stealing the word away. Other people receive it anon with joy, but then whenever persecution arises because of that word they've received, then by and by they stumble. Others, they like that word and receive it, and they go out and try to live it, and they try to put it into practice, but they've got too many Cadillacs and big bank accounts and worldly friends around them. Members in too many country clubs, and the cares of this world choke the word out then. And then some, with a good and an honest heart, receive the word, and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. That's a mystery in the kingdom of God. That's a mystery. He said, it's given unto you to know the mysteries in God's kingdom, but unto them it's not given. To them it is not given. Well, God has control. See, he has the word. We, by our intrusive curiosity, we cannot pry any secrets out of God. Jesus Christ has the word. He told the multitudes, he spoke to them in parables. He turned to the apostles and he said, it's given to you to know, let me explain what that parable meant. He didn't turn to the multitude and explain to them. He left them in their sin. He's going to go on to quote a verse here from Isaiah saying, go preach that word so that it will have this hardening effect on the people. Verses 16 and 17. Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. He probably has reference to the old dispensation. He calls them righteous men and prophets. He's not just talking about kings out there in the world have desired to know something and we're the only ones who get it. Many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things and to hear them, but they've not heard them and they've not known them like we do. Chapter 11 of this gospel, verses 25 to 30. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. You know who the babes are? Like me and you, if you believe it and live that way. Paul was a babe. Sometimes people like to think, well, the babe is just the person who just hardly knows or has anything, and God's going to be merciful. Paul was a great theologian, but Paul was a babe in Christ. A babe, in, in not, not in the sense of growth versus not growth, but in the sense of humility before God. He was just a babe. He wasn't wise and prudent. He repudiates that so that he can receive the wisdom of the knowledge of God. Wise and prudent in the things of the world. 
has to reveal them unto babes because we're just like God's children. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Look at the sovereignty involved. God's control of the particular revelation we're on now, the recipient. And no man, that's talking about recipients, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Sovereignty, revelation, reveal, it's all right there in this passage. And recipient, it's all here. Only the ones to whom the Son reveals the Father can know him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That has to be our attitude. God, we're tired of everything else. We just have to come to you for our needs to be met. And you know, the world out there is saying, tired, uh, laboring, heavy laden, uh, give you rest. I'm, I'm ready to get up and go. That's why the way of truth they have not known. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. John chapter 14 John, now go over to that gospel if we may. John 14, 16 through 20. Jesus said, I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive. God controls the recipients. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. See, the apostles already knew the Holy Spirit. He was with them in their ministry. He was the one who anointed and empowered them. Even Christ himself was empowered by the Spirit of God to work the works. He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he hath anointed me to preach and to do the works. So the apostles already knew the Spirit, but Jesus said something different is coming. He shall be in you in the baptism. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, and because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. 15.15, 15, Henceforth I call you not slaves, for the slave knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. He said, I call you friends because I've chosen you as recipients of the truth. He goes on, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Chapter 17, verses 6 through 9, and verses 20 through 22. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 28. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. The reason that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, Jeremiah 9, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So the self-disclosing God, friends, determines the if, why, when, where, what, how, and who of revelation in him alone. And it should serve to humble man and to drive him to his knees in absolute praise and adoration and thanksgiving. And it should serve as a severe critique against all of the humanistic, rationalistic attempts to know God, because God cannot be known by that way. Right in this very chapter is that... Um, uh, 21, the world by wisdom knew not God. Not by earthly human wisdom. The world by wisdom doesn't know God, hasn't known God, and never shall. So it should serve both to humble us so that we will praise God for what he's done, and it serves as a check against and a severe critique of <coughs> all of the purely academic 
human approaches to God and to things divine. These come by revelation. They come to particular people. God even, uh, in a, with a broad brush, paints a picture of them in verses 26 and 27, telling us, now basically these are the type people I choose. They're not the wise, not the mighty, and not the noble, but they're the foolish, they're the weak, and they're the base. Those are the recipients, basically, painted with a broad brush that I choose to reveal myself to and to reveal uh, things divine.